How can ASEAN's economic dynamism, which we celebrate today, how can ASEAN's economic integration, which we aspire to, how can that be accompanied by greater financial inclusion? We also ask ourselves how ASEAN's economic integration can be accompanied by greater financial access for micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. And as we ask these questions, we remind ourselves that notwithstanding 50 years of amazing progress, some 265 million people within ASEAN, some 44% of the working population of ASEAN are non-banked or without access to basic banking facilities. To lead the discussion here this afternoon, we have an excellent panel. We have Governor Nestor Espinilla, the governor of one of ASEAN's most dynamic economies, the governor of the Central Bank of the Philippines. We have Dato Sri Nazir Raza, the preeminent banker of his generation, chairman of the CIMB Group. We have Alex Feldman, the CEO of the US ASEAN Business Council. We have Tan Sri Rebecca Fatima, Senior Policy Advisor, Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. We have three outstanding entrepreneurs, Anthony Thomas, CEO of the FinTech Mint. We have Robbie Antonio, CEO of Revolution Precrafted, the first Philippine startup unicorn. And we have David Foote, founder and CEO of Xenia, which applies artificial intelligence to wellness and well-being. The conversation in ASEAN used to be about integration. Now it is increasingly about inclusion. Because the world has come to realize that integration, growth, and dynamism is a hollow promise if not accompanied by inclusion. So my first question to you um, is, what is the central challenge that ASEAN faces in terms of financial inclusion? Where is the Why is it that after 50 years of dramatic progress, we still have 44% of ASEAN's working population without access to basic banking services. Maybe we'll begin with you, um, Governor, if you could present your views, and then I will moderate a lively discussion by calling on each of you, but not in the order of the sequence. And we will see how this conversation takes us. If there is time, I'd like to also ask for one or two questions from the floor, but Governor, what, in your view, is the central challenge of ASEAN financial inclusion? Thank you, Timothy, for, the, for that, uh, the way you frame that issue. I think the main reason why it has taken us so long to tackle the problem of uh, financial inclusion is really the lack of a strong policy framework to address this issue. I think the fundamental problem, the flip side of uh, the issue of financial inclusion is financial exclusion. I don't think, or the approach was, financial exclusion was a non-problem. In other words, it was treated with apathy. When we started looking at the issue some two decades ago, uh, there was very little to, uh, to take a look at in terms of this space. It was not even a very mainstream topic. 
for a central bank, a financial re a regulator, to take upon. But it was important to define and to realize that financial e exclusion is an, is an issue, especially if you're operating in an economy where large uh, segments of the population are unbanked, and there are many micro, small, and medium enterprises who have no access to credit. You cannot ignore the problem. So for the, for the BSP, we took a very long journey of creating a policy framework that mainstream financial inclusion into the legitimate agenda of a central bank. We looked at financial inclusion as actually forming part of a policy complex that balances many considerations that the central bank worries about. Financial stability, you also worry about the integrity of the financial system, that it is not a venue for uh, illegal activities. Uh, you also worry about the protection of consumers. So you need to weave this into a policy framework where financial inclusion takes its legitimate position in the overall policy agenda if one is really interested in equitable economic growth. But defining the problem is just, uh, defining it as a legitimate problem is just uh, one part of the issue. Tackling it is also a complex one. So we need to recognize that this is a multifaceted issue that requires a whole of government approach and possibly also a lot of collaboration between the public and the private sector. This is especially the case, uh, for example, when we want to create a better environment for micro, small, and medium enterprises. It's not just only about providing access to credit. It's also about increasing the capacity of uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises, making them uh, access uh, markets, uh, developing their own uh, internal abilities. So you need to collaborate with other players in government as well as uh, outside of government. Now we are lucky because uh, we are seeing the entry of uh, digital technology that will make us, uh, that will enable us to solve many of the old problems in an easier way. For example, some of these problems are all about how do you deliver in a cost-effective manner to a market that is very difficult to serve. How do you bridge geography? Philippines is an archipelago of more than 7,100 islands. How do you reach out to people and businesses that spread out over such a geography? How do you overcome infrastructure gaps uh, that are currently existing, uh, gaps in, in roads, gaps in uh, communication? And also, uh, how do you overcome gaps in information. Information is a big problem. Uh, knowing businesses, even the lack of identity is a big issue in, in, in the economy. So these are all problems that even a determined uh, player like, like the BSP as regulator cannot do alone. We need to collaborate and nurture partnerships so that we can solve these problems. At the same time, keep an open mind to innovation, especially digital technology, to enable us to solve problems. Thank you very much, Governor. So the Governor locates the challenge in the policy framework and in partnerships between the public and private sectors. Dr. Nazir, for many years, you were your generations, and still now, your generations preeminent banker. So under your leadership, CIMB Bank has gone from a smallish, Malaysian banking enterprise to now one of ASEAN's leading banks. For many years, you champion ASEAN economic integration. But that integration has fallen short when it comes to financial inclusion. Where do you see the central challenge of ASEAN financial inclusion? Thank you, uh, uh, Tim. First and foremost, I agree uh, we have failed in terms of achieving respectable levels of inclusion. Um, and I agree with the governor, uh, the policy framework uh, has been a shortcoming. But also as I reflect um, on building a, a bank, 
uh, in the past, uh, we have uh, been too focused on our bottom lines. Uh, and here, I think inclusion must also be seen in the context of the need to change the value system of businesses, banks included. Yeah, I think it's not enough in this new era to think purely about shareholder returns. Right? The new era corporation, to me, sure, looks forward with aggression, determination, but must look sideways with love and compassion. Uh, that new framework is evolving, um, and companies must then step up, make their own decisions in terms of what their new value systems are. Um, at CIMB, we announced um, on Sunday um, that we now have adopted a policy of um, um, contributing 1% of our annual profits to corporate social responsibility. And corporate social responsibility is not about dishing out cash, right? It is also about using uh, uh, resources, i.e. your own um, staff, as well as your financial resources, uh, to help uh, others. It's not about giving fish, it's about giving, uh, providing fishing rods, uh, for instance. Uh, so that's uh, one point. Two is, uh, I also agree that um, uh, technology uh, is now a great uh, enabler uh, for greater financial inclusion. Uh, but I think I'd like to look at it in a bigger context, which is that we are in the early stages of the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, and the fourth industrial revolution is, has huge potential for SMEs, huge potential to improve uh, inclusion. The question is whether ASEAN, ASEAN countries, and the whole of ASEAN uh, as an organization, will step up and optimize the potential of the fourth industrial revolution for uh, inclusion. Yeah. As of today, we've seen, I think Thailand has a plan, Thailand 4.0, uh, Singapore uh, has uh, its plan, Malaysia has its plan. But I think those plans uh, to deal with the fourth industrial revolution are not enough because increasingly the challenges of the fourth industrial revolution are not, you know, it's, it's about cross-border. It's about uh, enabling uh, movement of data. Data is at the heart of the fourth industrial revolution, but there's so many restrictions in ASEAN today about movement of data, right? How then do we take full advantage of the fourth industrial revolution and technology if we're so restrictive on data? Then we talk about enabling SMEs. Uh, today, you know, when I talk to SMEs, some of them are so excited about, you know, being a small mom and pop business, say, selling scarves in, in Medan, but suddenly discovering the internet and being able to sell throughout Indonesia. But the potential is to sell throughout ASEAN. But yet, there's a lack of clarity as to how, uh, the, uh, how they can actually distribute right across ASEAN, the logistics around, right, enabling them to take advantage of the whole ASEAN market. Yeah, so, so, Tim, so again, my points are, we have gotta do better, um, companies have to change their value system, uh, and thirdly, the fourth industrial revolution is going to be beneficial for SMEs and uh, 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 inclusion at large, but ASEAN needs to step forward and, and make those necessary changes to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nazir. Uh, that's, that's making a very profound point, because the, the, one of the most difficult things in the world is to change values and the way people look at things. So if the main challenge is a kind of revolution in the way we think, that's uh, making a, a fundamental point that we need to discuss. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to jump from macro perspectives to three micro pers perspectives. We have in this panel three entrepreneurs who are operating in the fourth industrial revolution. Um, we have David Foote, we have Robbie Antonio, and we have Anthony Thomas. I I'd like to go to you, David. You are founder and CEO of Xenia, which applies, I believe, artificial intelligence to wellness and well-being. What 
do you see as the central challenge of ASEAN financial inclusion? Give us a perspective from where you are. Sure. Um, so I'll give two perspectives. Uh, one from the, the aspect of our service providers. We have 250 service providers um, in Zenia. David, a bit. Uh, we have 250 service providers in Zenia, many of them previously unbanked. Uh, we've, we've banked all of them. In fact, we're paying all of them with Bitcoin and we've created accounts for all of them. But one of the challenges has been the access to banking is limited by the transactional, the minimum transactional volume. Right? They're not able to open accounts unless they have $100 of, of, of income. And generally, that's already a barrier. And what I see the challenge here is banking institutions are not equipped for microtransactions. They're not equipped to bank the unbanked because of the overhead. Uh, I believe that technology and startups can help, fintech can help with this. By lowering the barriers, by using technology to make it more efficient, we can, we can bring them onto the platform. But what we've seen is once we brought them onto the platform, literally within one to two weeks, they're paying bills online, they're remitting money to each other, they understand, they grasp it right away. Right? It's just they have not been introduced and they are not able to because of the financial barriers. Uh, the, the other challenge I'll speak of is, uh, as a startup, and I believe startups have a big role to play in driving innovation, it's difficult to get funding within this region for early stage. There's a variety of uh, Series A venture capitalists that can invest three to five million, but in the early stages, it's, it's limited. Uh, David, uh, maybe closer to your... Closer? Okay. Okay. Uh, but in, in, the early, in the earlier stages, the, there's limited funding, and the, the issue is risk. There's not a lot of institutional capital that's willing to take the risks to fund early stage companies that are able to drive innovation. So, uh, just to make sure I've got it right, two, two key points. The banking system is not equipped to handle micro transactions um, and access to funding for small enterprises and startups is a challenge. That's correct. correct? That's yes. correct. Robbie, um, you have a very interesting background. Thank you. And um, you have created um, the first Philippine unicorn startup. Um, tell us from, your, from where you stand, the journey that you have taken, what is the central challenge of financial inclusion? Sure. So I actually grew up in Silicon Valley. I went to Stanford Business School where there was a plethora of venture capital firms. And so funding was never an issue. So I would go to Sand Hill Road, pitch, a de pitch an idea, and there, was a, there were a myriad of venture capital firms who would essentially come up with early stage or seed uh, funding for a concept, for a mere concept. There are about a thousand unicorns, most of which are situated in America for one and one reason, access to funding. It's not like we have fewer brilliant people here in Southeast Asia. We're obviously all close to double the population of America, right? There are only nine unicorns in Southeast Asia, um, which really brings me to my point. Um, as my co-panelist has said, access to funding in the Philippines is not as ideal or as, as, uh, as available um, as in America or in Europe, shall we say, um, in developed markets. So I personally, um, in this journey, had to go abroad. So I went to institutional investors, um, went to the most prolific seed VC fund in the world, got funding from them because it brings legitimacy. Um, obviously, I have access to extremely high net worth individuals, but I did not want to go that road. Um, to be a real tech startup, you have to be backed by a real tech VC fund. So that's the road I actually uh, parlayed uh, to myself and achieved uh, in a very short amount of time. So um, I, I think we all have our part, um, especially, you know, I mean, of, of course, the, the government in terms of funding micro entrepreneurs, which um, are seated in the back road, back row. And, and I think that if you do not have, a, you know, do not have access to capital here, go be resourceful and go somewhere else, really. Uh, there are other countries, I mean, talk about Indonesia, talk about Malaysia, where actually there are more early stage VC funds than the Philippines. So go pitch to them 
um, if you can't find access here. Thank you very much. So your response would be, there are limitations in the environment, but as an entrepreneur, if one meets with those constraints, go somewhere else, and if the idea is strong enough, the funding is there. I mean, if it's not available, you have no other option, right? Yes. So um, go be resourceful and go look, look, look where there is actually a preponderance of that. Anthony, Anthony Thomas. Sure. I'd like to come back actually to uh, Governor Espinilla uh, because that's really the context for Mint as well in the Philippines and in the fintech space. And while he suggested that it's the policy framework, I, I think the BSP actually needs credit for a fairly progressive policy framework. In my mind, the central challenge is around a cost-efficient model, which I think as, uh, Governor Espinilla talked about as well, a cost-efficient model for banks to really serve uh, MSMEs and individuals below a certain economic threshold. And there are three aspects to that. One is banks have traditionally tried to do it with physical presence, but we are geographically spread out countries. Uh, small value transactions that make a huge difference to people's daily lives are seen as expensive to process. And for MSMEs that really fuel the economy, they're seen as high risk because of limited financial information uh, as well as collateral at times. So as a result, in our context in the Philippines, it turns out that seven out of 10 Filipinos don't have access to a bank account and even fewer have access to formal credit. I'm not talking about informal lenders at usurious rates, but that results in Filipinos waiting in line for everything, from their salary to a disbursement from the government to transportation to paying for their bills to load their prepaid, prepaid mobile phones, all of that. And while that's the challenge, uh, as a practitioner, the opportunity is around the mobile phone, in my mind. Uh, the fact that it is ubiquitous, that almost every adult in our countries has a mobile phone of some form, uh, gives us this, this opportunity. Now, Mint started off as the fintech arm of Globe Telecom. So that gives us access to 60 million subscribers in a country with a population of 100 million. So that's a starting advantage. But I think my point around the, the challenge and what is needed to overcome it is collaboration. And we recently announced a strategic joint venture with Alipay or Ant Financial from China precisely because we wanted access to a platform that has performed at scale at scale where 520 million users in China and 8 million SMEs now have access to basic financial services. And the sweet spot for Ant in China is precisely around those low value transactions which make a difference to people's daily lives. Uh, and that's what we really want to have access to. And what goes with it, of course, is expertise in risk management. So access through the telco, but also platform and risk management expertise in a collaboration. Uh, and then further, locally in the Philippines, we've also brought in Ayala Corporation as a direct investor because they help enable the ecosystem uh, with access to malls and the like. So I think the point is really around collaboration uh, across technology companies, banks, telcos, retail, to try and address the challenge. And I'll just give you one example of how we've tried to make a difference with MSMEs in particular, where we are now enabling MSMEs to accept electronic payments. And we do this at a very low cost. It's simply a QR code on a sticker, which then is confirmed in terms of transactions even on a feature phone. So today Gcash, 
which is our, our customer brand, uh, is used as a means for MSMEs to start accepting payments with virtually no cost. And then we drive customers with incentives to actually pay through these electronic means. And what this then leads to is the financial information that will be required to extend credit. So that's how we're, we're trying to use the best of all of these different market players to address the challenge around a cost-efficient model for financial inclusion. Thank you very much. Very useful point. So the mobile phone and technology is a big part of the solution. Uh, I'm, I'm going to get a response after we've gone around the panel. I'd like to get a response from Dato Nazir on the question of fintech and how significant you think it is as part of the solution. And I'd like to also, when we get into the next round of discussions, ask the governor what he thinks, how important is government a part of the response to this challenge? But Tansri Rebecca, for years you were at the forefront of the economic integration of ASEAN as a senior official in the Malaysian government. You were in the trenches, so to speak. Now you are a scholar. Your time is spent thinking deeply about these questions. Can you draw this connection between financial economic integration and economic inclusion? For a long time, we just talked about integration. Now we realize that the conversation is only half complete. Are the two things part of the same conversation, or do we need to talk about them separately? Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I think from the get-go, when we were looking at ASEAN economic integration, the inclusion element was very, very important for us in terms of in making sure no one is left out in, in, when you look across the board, whether it's member states, whether it's industry, uh, private sector players. And that's why you have, as a matter of principle, the special and differential treatment. This is at the very macro level, at the very policy level. But when you, when you dive deeper and the, there's a consciousness of the importance of the role of the MSMEs, and quite ahead, a number of years ago, we, we worked on the SME strategic action plan. Um, and, and that's and included in that is, a, is access to finance, and that's, that's core. And then there are also less than successful proposals that came to the table. And these came to the table through the private sector. I, I, want, to, I want to point out one um, that was highlighted. That there is this awareness, there is this realization that you need to have uh, financial inclusion, that you need to have uh, enable MSMEs to have better access to finance. And when Malaysia was chair of ASEAN, the ASEAN Business Advisory Council had a proposal on the table which I thought was worth taking through, um, but it has not seen the light of day. And I, I think maybe time is right for it to, to be revived, to revisit. This was the establishment of some sort of ASEAN mechanism I don't want to go down the route of calling it an SME bank, but some sort of financial mechanism for ASEAN SMEs. Um, we've managed to have a consolidated strategic action plan for SMEs, SME development, but that important aspect of financing has somehow um, not seen the light of day. I think time, time to ver revisit that. But even as we talk of financial inclusion, we cannot leave out other aspects of uh, trade um, economic integration, and these have to be done in parallel. It's not one after another or one before the other. So it has to be done in parallel, looking at trade facilitation, looking at logistics, looking at e-commerce. All these have to be done in concert and, and not at, you know, the paced way. And, and that's, that's the phasing and the pacing of, of, of initiatives is what has caused us to fall short of our aspirations. So we can have further conversations on that. I'm sure uh, Dr. Nazir has a lot to say on that score. Thanks. So um, integration and inclusion are inextricably linked, part of the same conversation. Alex, saving the best for last. Um, American companies 
have been a very important part of the ASEAN growth story. And American companies have been an integral part of the integration of the region. Give us your view, listening to this discussion. The big, the macro views express, the views from entrepreneurs in the fourth industrial revolution. What is your view? Where would you locate the central challenge of financial inclusion in ASEAN? Well, first of all, thank you, and I want to thank the organizers for ABIS for uh, an amazing conference, and Dr. Hong for your moderation. Um, I'd like to change the, the terms around a little bit and say, what are the opportunities for financial inclusion? And uh, I think there's, there's uh, a one set of terms that sum it up, and that's the digital economy. The digital economy we've been talking about uh, throughout this panel, and uh, it really is the game changer that allows small and medium-sized, micro and individuals to uh, bring themselves up the financial econo and economic ladder. Um, and we think there's a huge opportunity in ASEAN. Uh, as of last year, there were 260 million uh, internet users or, or people online. Uh, that's going to, by 2020, going to rise to 480 million. There's already over 700 million uh, mobile phone accounts, and we, we heard a little bit about that. But all of this allows for individuals and small and medium-sized and micro enterprises to access the national, the regional, and indeed the global markets, and to do so with a relatively small team and relatively small starting point in financing. Um, but there are a number of things I think have to go into that to allow for that environment to thrive and the governments of ASEAN, if they can come together and produce ASEAN uh, initiatives on, on the digital economy, will greatly increase this. But obviously each country's uh, individual government also has a huge role to play. And the first thing is obviously you need the infrastructure and you need to make sure that you have the bandwidth and the distribution of broadband so that uh, individuals, no matter where they are, and ASEAN is, is challenging in that many, uh, many people are uh, remote in, in islands, uh, as they are in the Philippines and Indonesia and Malaysia. But um, it also requires uh, the payment systems to be there. And certainly the American companies get this and want to be part of the, the picture and Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, uh, as well as Apple Pay, Google Pay, um, and other companies that are more new to this market like Square, all want to play and be a part of, part of the system. Governor, you're, uh, you're thinking about uh, payment gateways, uh, both here in the Philippines and throughout ASEAN, and obviously um, that's an important uh, feature to ensure that uh, uh, payments and financial transactions are secure. But we, when you're doing that, we hope that you'll think about competition, allowing competition to thrive, allowing international players to serve markets and to serve the players here in uh, the Philippines, as well as throughout Southeast Asia. Um, but beyond payment systems, you also, you also need uh, um, the training for the entrepreneurs and the digital uh, exposure. And companies like uh, Facebook and Google are, are training people Throughout, throughout ASEAN, but so is the U.S. ASEAN Business Council, which represents over 150 of the major multinationals that have invested over $273 billion in ASEAN alone. And that $273 billion is more than American companies have invested in India, China, Korea, and Japan combined. So American companies get that this region is where the action is, and we want to be part of, part of the game. Uh, the U.S. ASEAN Business Council has created something called the U.S. ASEAN Business Alliance for Competitive, SME, for competitive SMEs, which uh, has helped train over uh, 5,000 entrepreneurs and small businesses throughout all 10 countries. But we also created something called the ASEAN uh, SME Academy, which is an online presence, which we hope you'll take a look at, where the major U.S. multinationals have uh, donated their expertise and their, their learning as they uh, have developed and, and sharing that online 24 uh, hours a day, seven days a week with everyone from across ASEAN. So we think the digital economy will help uh, financial inclusion like no other uh, event in history. Yeah, so you, you locate 
the central opportunity in the digital economy. But you also make the point that the infrastructure has to be there and the regulatory frame framework has to be there. Now, I, I'm looking for, you know, for a good discussion. Um, it's sometimes useful to locate differences in views. Now, I'm not sure whether there are any. We may all agree on exactly the same thing, which is fine, but um, important discussions of this kind is generally never unanimous. I, I'm interested to get a view, a response from Dato Nazir, whether you have the same confidence that the key to this, to success in the 21st century, the fourth industrial revolution, is in the digital economy. Now, we all agree that it's a very important part of the solution, but do you have the same optimism that it will be our answer to financial inclusion? And after that, I'd like to invite the governor to present his views on what government can do. And if any of the panelists have strong views or strong responses to what has been said, please indicate to me and I'll come to you. Uh, Tim, my apologies, um, but I don't have a different opinion. Uh, I think the future is going to be um, digital, uh, viz financing and banks. I think already um, digital plus AI has, you know, we can already visualize and we can see it in China how um, the cost to serve has been brought down, the ability to do credit decisioning yeah, has been made much faster uh, and so far yeah, uh, even better in terms of um, the um, credit defaults, etc. Uh, and certainly digital has enabled um, uh, uh, a reach that we could never dream of uh, before. Ironically, uh, CIMB, our response to this has really been focused on our subsidiary called Touch and Go, uh, which is a uh, the transportation card for Malaysia. And so Touch and Go has its you know, 10 million customers already uh, and what have you. So we have layered Touch and Go uh, with a partnership with Ant Financial, yeah, which actually is what you're doing. Uh, and so it struck me that maybe if ASEAN had got it together and given us the scale um, when us, I'm sorry, I'm looking at you, Rebecca. When you promised you'd give us the scale, uh, then maybe, you know, you, it's not about us partnering uh, Ali, maybe Mint and CIMB, yeah, or Touch and Go could have partnered instead, yeah. But now it looks like, you know, there's going to be Ali in every country and, you know, payments will be dominated by Ali instead of one of us. Thank you very much. So, in that respect, ASEAN dropped the ball and did not deliver scale. So, missed opportunities. Thank you very much. Governor. My take on this is, well, I think we, there's common agreement that the future is digital. But is digital inevitable? I think there is room for government through policy to create the environment that, that allows the mainstreaming in a way that is uh, centered on customers. Because we, Government has to play a role here to manage the competitive forces and to identify the area for operation and coordination. It cannot just be all winner take all. And the outcome of those kinds of battles, as you know, is that there may be big winners, but customers may not necessarily be the big winner. So policy can be driven, for example, to promote interoperability of market players. It should be that, yes, there is competition, that there will be different solutions provided, but customers should be given a choice as to what kind of solution works best uh, for their uh, business needs or their personal needs. And the way to do that is for government to encourage uh, arrangement where it's interoperability. One system talks to another so that uh, information flows and money flows throughout the system rather than being compartmentalized in segments of conglomerates or alliances and other parts are deprived of that. So I think 
competition is good because that will be operating in the best interest of customers. Yeah. Thank you very much. And Sri? Yeah. Can I just say this? The, the fourth industrial revolution and the digital economy, while helping economies bridge and, and, and uh, make quantum leaps, for example, if government and regulators don't get their act together, we will widen the divide. So instead of bridging divides, we will deepen them. So uh, the, the role of government and the private sector is, is so important in this regard. I think that's a very useful point because, in fact, um, Dr. Nazir made the same point when he said ASEAN has not delivered scale because the scale that ASEAN is supposed to deliver is a matter of government policy. If governments are not able to align themselves, we will be fragmented markets, we will not have scale, yeah. and the promise of the digital economy will elude us. Um, I, I, I just want to get some quick responses from the three entrepreneurs who are clustered on the other side of the panel. Whether this discussion, is this resonating with you, or it just seems something a little irrelevant? Um, so, David, but very quick responses because I see from the teleprompter that sure. time is running out. So. Sure. No, it, it absolutely resonates. And uh, obviously, we're strong believers in the digital economy, and we use artificial intelligence ourselves. But I believe that government has a very important role to play here as well. The, the challenge is that the, there's a trust challenge. And many of our customers are making an online purchase for the first time. It's very difficult to explain to them that their bank doesn't work well, but another bank does. So they all have to work. And this is where I believe the government regulations also come in. It's a combination of the digital opportunities to create better systems, but then encourage all the operators to work together so that money is ubiquitous. Both things have to come into play, from my perspective. Thank you very much. Robbie? So, so I, I don't think it's just about digital. I think it's about innovation. I think, you know, I, my, I'd like to amend my first response, which are, where, in, where I really bring access to funding. I think if even if funding is there and is readily available, I think you need to have a kick-ass, pardon my French, a kick-ass business plan to really get that amount of funding that you need to succeed. Um, so, and, and you see the digital economy obviously changing the landscape. Just last week alone, um, Alibaba sold in one day 25 billion worth, US dollars worth of inventory. Not even the biggest mall in America sells that in two or three quarters. So, I mean, the kind of innovation that you see these days is obviously unbelievably game-changing. Did you expect prior to 10 years ago that you would share your room with a stranger? No. Prior to Airbnb, that never really existed. So these businesses that actually are achieving these um, major accomplishments are really disrupting the entire industry. Truly category killers, uh, shall we say, right? So it's this kind of philosophy in business that would actually um, propel you to get funding and to succeed, I feel, in this um, environment. Thank you very much. Anthony? Uh, the conversation's entirely relevant for us, and this is square on what our business model is based on, right? Uh, in terms of the digital economy being the future. But let me just acknowledge, even as a digital player, the importance of having partners with physical presence on the ground. Because there is always that last mile, particularly in countries like ours, where we don't have a very large banked population, that while a lot can happen on the mobile phone, cash has to get into the wallet and cash has to be taken out easily. And that's where we partner with banks so that we can, can, because ultimately a banked customer then has to pay an unbanked individual or an unbanked merchant. And we partner with retail. So the likes of a 7-Eleven where beyond the physical presence of bank branches, one can go and cash into a wallet at a 7-Eleven. So there's still a place for partnership between players who have strong physical presence and trusted brands with fintech players like ourselves. Thank you very much. Alex? 
just want to add that uh, in, in all these uh, concerns, data is really the key currency of, of the future and how governments handle data. And obviously there's real concerns around privacy as well as security, but how they handle that, those data regulations will be key to how well ASEAN does in the digital economy. Um, we need to be able to have, from an international company's perspective, free flow of data as much as possible. And from an SME's point of view, I don't think you want to be putting uh, data centers in each country that you serve around the world. I don't think that will be a game changer for the negative for SMEs. Um, so we need to work with governments, and as uh, Dr. Rebecca said, we need to partner, private-public partnership in, in terms of developing the rules and regulations around how data is handled. Thank you very much. We have about seven minutes left, so this is what I propose. Imagine that we were meeting a panel of ASEAN policymakers. Now, the governor himself is a policymaker, so for the governor, I'm... I will tweak the question. But imagine those of us who are not in government are in front of a panel of ASEAN government policymakers, and we have to do a half a minute elevator pitch, something that is of crucial importance to the discussion that we've been having today. Uh, I know that Dato Nazir did such a pitch earlier today. You made a presentation to ASEAN leaders. But I'm talking here of a half a minute elevator pitch. What would you say? So, David. Uh, I would say that the government should uh, help encourage investment, early stage investment, through subsidies or any other form of regulation, as well as openness between financial institutions so that they can all work together and to raise the bar on their technology level as quickly as possible. Thank you. Robbie. Yeah, so really quickly. Um, there exists other third parties where banks don't um, make cash available, higher forms of debt. Um, some of my friends are in that business here, right? So um, for people who have no collateral, fintech companies are actually there, or other traditional third parties, lenders actually do that. That's for debt side. But for the equity side, I, if I were to pitch to a policymaker, really try to create a more robust ecosystem of venture capital firms, um, early stage PE firms here in the country, along, alongside um, obviously Southeast Asia as well. Because with that availability of capital, you'd be funding a lot of these talented entrepreneurs who are always seeking uh, ways to expand their business or start their business who have never had the chance. Venture capital, Anthony. Uh, I'll come back to the business model challenge. Uh, so my plea to policymakers would be to focus on making it less onerous for providers uh, to acquire customers, merchants, even agents. Uh, embrace new technologies like the cloud, which brings down the cost of operations. Uh, and in some cases, maybe even share the risk for businesses that have high potential to solve. Uh, systemic risk still needs to be managed, but can probably ma be managed where the smaller, more innovative players are allowed till they get to a certain scale to, to innovate. Uh, and then once they get to a certain scale, you build in uh, the controls. And what's in it for them? Uh, beyond the economic benefit uh, and the convenience for citizens, uh, it also makes it safer and it avoids leakage into the informal economy which uh, should reduce crime and then provide an expanded tax base, which ultimately gives prosperity for all. Thank you. Nazir? Well, I would remind them, or I would highlight to them that, look, the fourth industrial revolution is a revolution because it's going to be hugely disruptive to businesses, to economies, to society. What got ASEAN here, the ASEAN way, has done well but it ain't going to get us there. And if we, pers if we persevere with the way we're going about things, it's positively dangerous. Yeah? If you look at the projections, 56% of jobs in ASEAN are under threat right, by advances in technology. Huge inequality is in the offing, right? et cetera, et cetera. So ASEAN really needs to sit down and say, Fourth Industrial Revolution, what does it mean? 
how do we prepare ourselves, how do we need to change, how are we going to recalibrate the capacity and financing of the ASEAN Secretariat, etc., uh, etc., et to deal with the fourth industrial revolution. If we don't, the future generations are going to curse us because uh, this is a real threat uh, to uh, prosperity in the future of ASEAN. Would you agree that the ASEAN way needs disrupting? Oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Uh, but, you know, with due respect, it's got us here. Uh, but certainly, it needs to be uh, completely overhauled. Starting with the way the ASEAN Secretariat is funded, can you imagine the amount, of work, the amount they have to do? And they get $20 million a month, yeah? Contributed equally by each country, right? Uh, that needs to totally change. I, I would suggest, pick a number, I think 10 times. It needs at least 200 million US dollars. It needs a new organization structure to really cope uh, with what it needs to do vis the fourth industrial revolution. Thank you. Oh, Automatically. Dem dem relatively well the last 50 years, but going forward, it cannot carry on as we've done in the past. We cannot revel in the glory of our past achievements. So I've, I've said this a few times, we need to change the ASEAN way. Um, we need to relook what it means to have ASEAN centrality. And really we need to rethink the three pillars. And I think that would get us to the next 50 years. The social political, I'm sorry, the political security pillar, the economic pillar, the social cultural pillar, I think it needs a, a, re, a re look. Thank you. I, I, and I think that's a very important point that we don't um, think about enough because we keep on talking about the need to adapt, the need to disrupt in the area of technology and business, uh, but we, there are sacred cows that we never touch on which may need rethinking. So, Alex. I think uh, I thought I was going to have uh, just a few seconds at the end, but uh, I think that uh, I, I do agree with all my fellow panelists on all the points they've made, especially with uh, Nazir's. But um, as ASEAN goes forward into this new unknown of the digital economy and the fourth industrial revolution, there are two things that I think uh, ASEAN has to keep in mind. One is innovation and creating an innovative economy and allowing for innovation either by creating sandboxes or by uh, allowing uh, entrepreneurs to uh, try new ideas. And the, th the second thing is competition, to allow and ensure that competition from wherever it comes, whether it's from the SMEs from, uh, up from, from below, or whether it's from uh, the uh, international companies from outside, should be uh, kept in uh, a high priority, and that you should thrive with competition, and competition is what's gonna make companies great, and certainly, Companies like uh, Gojek and Grab have thrived with competition from, from companies like Uber as well, and that's created jobs for millions of uh, people around the world, um, and certainly uh, thousands of people, or tens of thousands of people here in, in Southeast Asia. So, you know, the governments really need to uh, go lightly with, uh, with regulation, but obviously security and privacy, as I mentioned before, are real issues, and ones that hopefully they can collaborate with the private sector as they develop those rules and regulations that help protect the people of Southeast Asia. Thank you very much. Governor, you are, you are addressing a group of ASEAN's business leaders. They all want to do the best for the region. What would be your advice to them? I'll say to the, to the leaders, to the business leaders, let's engage. Uh, what I mean by that is, at the national level, we need to create a framework of both cooperation and competition. We need to be able to create those spaces where we work together, build standards that protect consumers, build standards that allow us or allow businesses to deal with one another on fair terms. We, we build standards that protect the financial system from external at the same time, that partnership also allows each and every player to use their creative forces to create new products and innovation. And I would, and I would broaden that, that cooperative national strategy. So I'm talking about national strategies for financial inclusion. We have to be very deliberate about this. We have to extend that beyond the national borders at the regional level we need to bring together 
this uh, frameworks of uh, cooperation and uh, competition. So, uh, so for example, QR codes. There are so many kinds of QR codes right now. So we need to uh, agree on uh, certain stuff so that there will be uh, fuller interoperability and better customer uh, choices. So that's the proposition. Continuous partnership and engagement, but government should play a role of stabilizing uh, change. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of a very rich, diverse, exciting discussion. And really, we need a lot more time to complete this discussion. I will try to sum up the discussion in two minutes. When I listen to this discussion, I'm reminded of what the British historian John Rob Roberts, when he was asked at the end of his 700-page book, The Lessons of History, he was asked, what does history teach us? And he says that history teaches us only two things. The first is that things change much more quickly than what one would expect. And the second is that things change much less quickly than what one would expect. And when I listen to this exciting discussion, I'm reminded how much our future relies on the things that change, that will change much more quickly than what one would expect. We're talking here the digital revolution, the fourth industrial revolution, the disruptive technologies, the innovations that a number of our panelists have spoken about. But I'm also reminded that some things change much less quickly, much more slowly, in fact, than what one would expect. And some of our panelists have talked about Datun Azir, the importance of values and how we look at the world. And others have spoken about the importance of resilient, resilience. I mean, Robbie's story is partly when you don't have a solution, you look for a solution elsewhere. And the governor and Tansri, Rebecca, and um, Alex have spoken about the importance of government and the right regulatory frameworks. So as we enter into this discussion, we should think about all the promises that the digital revolution brings to us. But we also have to remember the importance of values, of resilience, of government, of the spirit, the human spirit that pers persists even when things are difficult. With that, I would like you to all join me in thanking this excellent panel for... Governor Nesta Espinella, thank you very much for your views. Dato Nazir, Tan Sri Rebecca, Alex Feldman, David Good, Robbie, Antonio, and Anthony Thomas. Thank you very much.